hey, hey. So today, we're talking about kids, and uh, we're talking about uh, corporate threats to them, and what we can do about it. And uh, my guests today are... Paula Rogovin. Oh, you need a microphone. Ah, Paula Rogovin. And you are... I teach, I've been teaching in New York City public schools for 44 years. I currently am at PS290, the Manhattan New School. And I'm also an activist in New Jersey where I live and co-founder of the Coalition to Ban Unsafe Oil Trains. And on the phone we have... This is Tiffany Finkanes. I'm a campaigner with Friends of the Earth. Friends of the Earth is uh, a national environmental organization. We're working to create a healthy and just world. And we have a number of campaigns focused on promoting clean energy and solutions to climate change, ensuring the food we eat and the products we use are safe and sustainable, and protecting marine ecosystems and the people who live and work near them. And I'm primarily focused on reducing pesticide use. And yeah, Friends of the Earth is a absolutely wonderful organization. And uh, FOE.org is definitely worth exploring. So, Paula, you were at, at City Hall today. We sure were. We, we had about 115 people from our school, uh, and we had a, about 60 children and, and the rest, parents, grandparents, babysitters, hmm. uh, and it was so exciting. In addition to us, there were a number of people from environmental groups from around New York City, which was really exciting. Why were you there? Well, in 2014, my st- Kindergarten students were learning about the foods in our cafe, in our cafeteria, at our school. They wanted to learn about the watermelon, the tomatoes, and they asked a lot of questions. And we did research for, you know, months and months about this. And uh, what age are these kids? Four and five. <laughs> and they wanted to know how these fruits were were grown and where they were grown. They are the curriculum in our classroom is based on their questions so we in the process of answering the questions they uh, we we talked about the problem of pesticides and the you know the insect pests that were harming not only the uh, they were killing the insect pests, but they were harming the workers, the f- the people who were picking the crops. And we did a lot of role plays. We pretended we were the workers, and we got rashes. We were coughing, and and so on. Oh, wow. We so we did role plays. This is over a period of of time, not not just a quickie uh, bit of research. So they they learned about that. They learned about why we have to wash our foods when we before we eat them, although uh-huh. that doesn't really do the whole <laughs> job. But um, the kids were really angry, as little kids are. You know, they're people of justice, kindergarten and first graders. I've taught mostly kindergarten and first grade right. in these 44 years. They were furious about this. And I don't like to leave kids unhappy, depressed, <laughs> worried. And so the only way around it that I found in my many years of teaching is to do something about it for kids to be proactive. So we made a list of what we could do. We wrote news articles. We we interviewed people who could teach us. There were some uh, grandparents of now my four of my students came in from Long Island, Jerry Balsam, Iris Balsam. They're activists on the same issue in Long Island, and they taught us about uh, pesticides, mm-hmm. but they also taught us about how you can try to get a law passed. So, okay, so we wrote, we also wrote plays so that we could teach our families. That's quite a curriculum for kindergarten. Yeah, <laughs> but they love it, and for, we've done the same kind of thing with first graders. So the, the the kids wrote a play, they presented for the families at night, they presented to the whole school during the day, and uh, Councilman Ben Kalos the, from our school district came into our school for something else, and I said to the principal, get him in our room. So he <laughs> came into our room. The kids told him so enthusiastically about their research about pesticides, 
and um, they're concerned about pesticides in New York City, not just, you know, in, in the farms and gardens. And he said, why don't you come to City Hall? So we went. This is 2014. We went to City Hall. The kids were climbing all over the, the, the podium up in the front because there were no <laughs> other people there. They were so excited. He, he said, do you have any questions? So they asked him a million questions because they're used to asking questions. It's so important. And so he answered the question. Then he looked at them very, very seriously and said, is there anything you want me to do? Very serious. And they started in their in their very kindergarten way. Ban toxic pesticides. <laughs> Use only nature's pesticides. Pass a law. And they were literally dancing around the chamber, council chamber of City Hall. And he then he they settled down a bit. He looked at them and with a very serious face, he said, I'll try. A year later, he contacted the school. He said, could we have a press conference in your schoolyard? We gathered those kids from the year before, from 2014, 15, and the current class that I had, and the parents and grandparents. Wow. And he announced that several council members were going to be introducing what's called intro 0800, or we say intro 0800, because that has more of a rhyme to it. <laughs> and we're kindergarten so um, it kind of lingered, and it was supposed to be heard in the, in the health committee. I tried numerous ways to get them to hear it. But finally, at the end of the summer, I got a letter from, uh, from Corey Johnson, Councilman Johnson, saying that they were going to have a hearing today, January, uh, September 26th. And um, Councilman Kalos worked with us, and we had... 11 and a half days of school to prepare for today. The kids and some, some of the children and parents over the last couple of weeks helped write a little skit, a very quick one that was going to be their testimony. I had my own testimony. And they presented a skit that took place in Central Park where you know there were weeds and pests and the workers were about to spray and the the families in Central Park um, shouted, "No way! Don't spray!" And the workers were saying, "Why not?" And the kids explained that these are toxic pesticides. These are to, the, to the actual workers, or they were playing workers? Pretend, pretend, They're pretend workers. yeah. Okay. And um, and they explained that you know what toxic means and and so on. And then they said um, that they that if nothing changes, we're going to make a great big fuss. And the workers said, can we join you? Because I wasn't, we're not anti-worker. Yeah. But, but um, so the workers joined in, in City Hall, the pretend workers and the kids. And the parents were there taking pictures. And, and they gave the kids signs that some of the parents had made for us, saying ban toxic pesticides, support intro 800. And the kids there in the council chamber, surrounded by environmentalist parents, grandparents, um, all together, um, what did we say? We said, um, hey, hey, ho, ho, toxic pesticides and herbicides have got to go. They said that three times and then inter, um, pass intro 0800. And then they said that a few times and they said, please. And then they sang, this land is your land. Because, you know, Woody Guthrie would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Just the first verse, the chorus. And you're listening to Ecologic <laughs> on WBAI New York, 99.5 FM and WBAI.org. Eight o'clock is late at to to have uh, kids on the air, but uh, they're certainly represented well by their teacher. And uh, uh, Tiffany, uh, could you give us a little uh, background on exactly uh, how toxic are pesticides and and what the alternatives are? Sure. I mean, this is really amazing work that's happening in New York. Um, <laughs> And I just have so much uh, hope right now after hearing that great account of what happened today. Um, so their work is so important because pesticides, as they said, are extremely toxic. So they're um, harmful to human health and the environment. They are linked to reproductive and developmental harm, kidney damage, cancer. They're also harmful to wildlife plants, pollinators, and natural ecosystems. And 
What's really concerning about a lot of pesticides is that they can easily drift, um, and so they'll show up in our water, in our soil, and they'll last for months to years. In some cases, pesticides can last up to almost 20 years in our environment. So they can have really long-term and immediate impacts for human health and the environment, but they're really not necessary. There are hundreds of studies that show that we can use integrated pest management, also known as IPM, um, or organic management of both our lawn and gardens, our green spaces like our parks and schools, and also in agriculture. So those methods use non-chemical, natural methods, and oftentimes mechanical or biological methods of pest control. Um, And they act against pests only when necessary. And they're important because they're using the least toxic methods as as a last resort. So that's really the best way we can possibly manage our environment and manage these pests in order to really protect human health in the environment. So what, what are some of the specific pesticides we're talking about? Well, I mean, there's a number of different pesticides. I think what folks might be most aware of that's gotten a lot of media attention recently um, are several classes of pesticides. So there's uh, an herbicide that's extremely toxic called glyphosate. It's most commonly known as Roundup. It's an herbicide. Um, It's linked to really detrimental human health effects. The World Health Organization came out recently saying that it's a probable carcinogen. Uh, There's also another um, widely used pesticide called neonicotinoids, neonics for short. Um, They're chemically related to nicotine, and they've been uh, widely linked to bee and pollinator decline. Um, And they're widely used as a seed treatment on over 140 crops in agriculture. They're oftentimes used in our own backyards and gardens. So there's been a number of studies that have found that a lot of pollinator-friendly garden plants that you might pick up in uh, your local hardware store have actually been pre-treated with these pesticides. So without even realizing it, the everyday person or consumer might be inadvertently harming bees Um, There's been thousands of studies that have come out showing that they're not only harming bees, they're harming a wide range of organisms essential to food production from butterflies to ladybugs to lacewings to earthworms. Um, And there was actually just a follow-up meta-study that came out last week by a global body of independent scientists that said these, these pesticides and insecticides are having widespread impacts on our environment, they're contaminating our soil, our water, and that we absolutely have to ban these pesticides in order to preserve our environment and our ecosystems. Um, Another really harmful class of pesticides that's gotten a lot of media attention recently is a class, uh, is a pesticide called clopyrifos. So this class of pesticides has been studied extensively in recent decades and it is extru- a number of scientific studies show that exposure to these pesticides are detrimental to ch- young children specifically. Um, they can cause brain damage, um, de- lead to developmental delays, lower IQ, um, and increase children's risk for ADHD and autism. And the EPA was going to move forward with banning all uses of clopyrifos, and unfortunately, due to the Trump administration and heavy pesticide manufacturer influence, Trump's EPA decided to not move forward with this ban. So this class of pesticides continues to stay on the market um, and will continue to wreak havoc on our environment and human health. What are some of the uh, brand names for that pesticide? So clopyrifos um, is predominantly used on in agriculture, so it's uh, used for on a variety of crops, ro- including row crops like corn and soy, and on a lot of fruits and vegetables. So a lot of farm workers have experienced um, sickness and illness as a result of exposure um, from applying these pesticides in the field. Um, so, for example, there was a huge evacuation in Central California in a cabbage field when a number of farm workers 
got really sick because of their exposure to clopyrifos. So um, it's it's really, really serious. And I think for the you know average homeowner that might be looking at it, it you would just need to look for the, the word clopyrifos on the back of the label. And maybe you should spell that for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a really tricky word. They make it hard for us to say some of these these chemical they names. Do. I think to get us to not talk about them. But the way you would spell it is C H L O R P Y R I F O S. Spell that again. C H L O R P Y R I F O S. And so that's that's one of the many pesticides to to look for. Uh, and uh, you would have loved to see Paula's expression as you were talking about this, <laughs> shaking your head at one point, <laughs> nodding, <laughs> nodding your head at another. Uh, it, it's, uh, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, we're living with these things, and and yet, it, it because we're living with it, I think people are find it easy to disregard uh, just how bad they are for our health. Yeah, I think so too, and unfortunately. They're really bad for our health. So um, there are thousands of registered pesticides, and unfortunately, we the way that we uh, register these pesticides is oftentimes as uh, conditional registration. So what that means is EPA allows them on the market before adequate uh, health and wow. testing has been done on them. So essentially what they're doing is saying, we're going to put them on the market until we do enough testing to show that they are actually harmful. And I mean, look, take the clopyrifos. It's clearly harmful. It's making people sick. It's causing brain damage for young children. But EPA has still not moved forward with banning it. So that means that we're allowing these pesticides to stay on the market. Usually what happens with conditional registration is after 10 years, if that threshold hasn't been met for EPA to decide to move forward with a ban, they just don't. Um, and it, the pesticide might come up for registration review. But again, unfortunately, because EPA is listening in most cases more to the manufacturer's recommendations than to sound science, sound independent science, they're not moving forward with taking these pesticides off the market, which have unintended consequences and really harmful consequences for human health and the environment. So, Tiffany, um, on what you're saying, uh, one thing that got some of us riled up today at the hearing was that there were some representatives from the city uh, who said, well, we're not spraying in all the parks and playgrounds. We're not doing that. And and where we're spraying, we're putting signs up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as if the pesticides don't go into the groundwater. And, and I said when I was doing my speech, you know, babies can't read. If, you're, mm-hmm. if they're putting signs up, babies can't read. Kids who are playing soccer and baseball, adults who are playing baseball, soccer, hanging out, picnicking, they're not looking at the signs. They're just being in the parks and enjoying the parks and using the parks. So um, I, I'm just hoping that we're not having a, uh, witnessing a campaign by some manufacturers to sabotage this legislation, which is why I really, really hope we can get people of all of New York City and the, the beyond, the BAI listeners, to um, to support the effort to get Intro 0800 passed because it's a step forward. So what do you want people to yeah, do, Paula? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, what we want to do, it was received very well by the Committee on Health. Um, we need at least 26 more co-sponsors so it will pass in the full council. We need people to uh, call uh, or write to the city council uh, members, particularly in the health committee, the parks committee, and the education committee. That would give us about 26 votes. If you have a member of the city council. The environment committee would probably be good, too. Environment committee, yeah. So... Uh, people need to call them and call them and write to them. And get, if you're a teacher, get your school behind it. Your, if you're a principal, get your school behind it. Get, ev- get your friends, your neighbors, everyone behind. It's called Intro 0800. 
And yeah, you can find the city council online. I, I link to the, the actual bill uh, on the Ecolinks page, so you can uh, find it there. Um, and Tiffany, you were about to say something? I was going to say it's so important for people to get active and make sure that they are contacting uh, their city council member to support this really vital piece of policy because the pesticide industry has extremely large tentacles. So in nearly every case around the country, whether it's a local policy or a state policy or federal policy, they pump th thousands of dollars in, into lobbying efforts to try to sway our policymakers to not listen to independent science and listen to science that shows that their pesticides are in some cases beneficial to the environment or necessary. Um, and so oftentimes our policymakers are really getting getting bombarded with misinformation. And so it's all the more important for people to get really active and make sure that their local policymakers are listening to these important studies and not just hearing from the other side. Now, are there alternatives to these toxic pesticides? Yes, absolutely. So um, as I said, there's integrated pest management. There's also organic management. And almost in every case, um, there are alternatives that we can use um, that are not chemical fertilizers or toxic pesticides um, in order to continue to keep our environment healthy and thriving. Um, and so, for example, uh, really, for, so it really depends on the specific pest problem. Um, but for example, you could use um, insecticidal soaps um, as a as an alternative to neonicotinoids. The other option could be biological control. So that would mean if you had a specific pest problem, you can in often oftentimes use um, a biological pest, so a natural enemy or predator of that pest, to help control the problem. So that's where the, the mention of ladybugs uh, came up. Uh, yeah, exactly. Some of those some of those insects are natural um, natural predators for some of the pests that folks are experiencing in their backyards or that we're experiencing as we're growing food crops. And so we can really use our natural environment in a lot of cases to help solve the problem. We really don't need to be relying on chemicals uh, to, to try to combat any sort of pest problem. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, the, the Central Park Zoo. Uh, they have that rainforest exhibit there. And they they get insects in there, so they can't spray poison on on the birds that are flying around. So they use natural insecticides, and one of the things they use is ladybugs, and and they get a delivery of a pillowcase full of ladybugs once a month. Oh, we have to go for that. We got to let us know when that's and, happening. And uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I would. They would love to have you folks in there. Um, and it's you know the, he was describing it where he'd get the pillowcase. And he'd walk in front of an infested plant, reach his arm into the pillowcase. The ladybugs would crawl up his arm. Then he'd sort of point at the plant. And they'd go off his arm and start eating the, the pests. <laughs> I love it. And he would do that in several <laughs> spots uh, throughout there. And, and they have to uh, keep uh, having ladybugs every month because the birds in there <laughs> will, will eat the ladybugs. Um, but it's, it's one, uh, you know, I, you don't have a closed environment in, in a whole park. You know, in in the in, in a zoo, the ladybugs can't get away. Um, whether mm -hmm. they could, so they can, they can survive. You don't have to replenish them all the time. And uh, there there are so many natural predators. And then I noticed on on um, one of Friends of the Earth documents, uh, there are things like diatomaceous earth as a control, and, and a few things like that. Yeah, there are a lot of um, natural. Uh, products that you can use as an alternative. Um, one really good resource that's out there is the Pesticide Research Institute has a database called um, the Prime Tool. And so you could uh, uh -huh. use the tool. It's free. And so you can go on. You could say, you know, I'm having a specific pest problem. Um, in, type it into the tool. And what will pop up are alternatives. And it rates it by... Uh, the least toxic alternative to the highest um, and the best way to manage that pest. The other way you can wow. use the tool that's really helpful is you could, if you have a product, say, in your, in your home that you're not sure if it's toxic or not, you can enter the name in there 
and it'll pop up and show you how toxic it is and why it's toxic, if it's toxic to specific animals. Um, And then again, you can sort of search to figure out what the best alternative is. So that's a really great database that's out there. So what's um, the website? That folks can use. Uh, I believe it's pesticideresearchinstitute.org. But if you... uh, I have to double check. If you Google Pesticide Research Institute, you can come up with the with the tool. And the name of the tool again is is um, the Prime Tool. So they have the P. There's a Prime Tool, and then also the PRI Pesticide Product Evaluator. So those are those are all important things to. to now, I would think, like, uh, New York City has a bit of an epidemic of, of bed bugs right now. That would be beneficial for those people, too, wouldn't it? Absolutely. You could go on and use that tool um, to be able to figure out the best way to try to combat your bed bug problem without using pesticides or toxic chemicals. So that's, that's called the pesticide what? Pes- PRI, Pesticide Product Evaluator. You know, and it's tif- pesticideresearch.org. Pesticide product value. I'm writing it down too. <laughs> Tiffany, yeah, and, and some sorry, plays. Pesticideresearch.com. And some of the <laughs> yeah, plays sorry, that we. The, some of the plays that we did, the children, uh, af- after they talked about the problem with pesticides, dressed up in costumes that the families helped us make. We had praying mantises and ladybugs and owls and spiders and frogs and, and all sorts of uh, what the kids call <laughs> nature's pesticides. So, And there's some lovely children's books that we've read so we could get more information about that, plus interviewing people. <laughs> That's great. And and uh, l- let me in- interrupt our discussion here. I was going to wait until the end of the show, but I think I want to uh, uh, bring the kids in uh, right now. Now, how can you resist that? Uh, well, you can if you're making millions of dollars off of pesticides. I suppose you can resist anything. Um, and you're listening to Ecologic here on WBAI New York, 99.5 FM and WBAI.org. Um, I'm here every other Tuesday evening from 8 until 9 when Out FM comes in. And, in fact, Naomi is, is here already. And... Uh, I'm just. Wondering, we've we've talked about uh, natural alternatives, and we've we've talked about some of the health problems. And I, yeah, uh, it's uh, so tempting because there are so many health problems to go into details. But I think that is really depressing radio. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering, Paula, what kind of reaction have you gotten from politicians who who are going to be hearing from both sides? Well, they seem very interested in what we're doing. That they seem very interested, but they're not interested enough yet. So what we're planning with the support of our principal and uh, parents in our school, um, we're planning to have a public forum about this. Mm. And we're hoping to invite some of the elected officials. So it'll be an educational forum. And people from the uh, School of Medicine of Mount Sinai are, and the chil- the Children's Environmental Health Center in Mount Sinai, they have been doing incredible research on this very topic. And if anyone wants resources about those horrible things that can happen from glyphosate and other... And Roundup uh, and all, all of that, them. Yeah. yeah. Um, they should go to Mount Sinai uh, a School of Medicine, Children's Environmental Health Center. They're going to... Help! They're going to help us by presenting scientific information at the forum, and we're going to try to bring the other elected officials 
and get them involved. Um, also, Beyond Pesticides uh, presented a huge amount of uh, information. Both places have in, in, uh, sent a lot of documentation to the committee. So we're trying to educate the members of the city council uh, and our community so that we can fight. And we, you know, we hope people around the city will do that. Parents, educators, we need everybody to get involved in that. Um, so no matter where you're listening, uh, if you're in the five boroughs, contact your city council representative and, and tell them to get on, online and, and co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. Ask them to co-sponsor uh, INT uh, 0800. Uh, because uh, it's very, very important that it have a lot of sponsors from a lot of committees. And once there are several city council people on different committees that are co-sponsoring something, eventually the leaders of those committees do, and that pretty much gets everybody in that committee, uh, the rest of them uh, online. And uh, it can happen slowly. It can happen quickly. It's best if it happens quickly, because uh, if it happens slowly, then the pesticide money starts pouring in. We can't let it happen slowly because Councilman Kalos, who introduced the bill, he's the main, was the original sponsor, his term ends the 31st of December. So we have to move very, very quickly on this. So we really need everyone's help soon. <laughs> yeah, and uh, <laughs> uh, when something affects children, uh, as pesticides do, and it affects them a whole lot more, uh, yeah, I, I remember my aunt telling me that you know she was refusing the, the people spraying pesticide in her lawn, but most of the people on her block did. And there'd be these little red flags. That's all the warning they had was a red flag. And there are the kids running around on the grass in bare feet with poison all over the grass. Yeah. And uh, it, it's a very cavalier treatment that we have toward pesticides. You have little cartoon characters uh, on insecticide commercials, and so everything seems so harmless. This is a poison. You're killing a living thing. And, you know, you're a living thing, too. And a child is a living thing, too. And they're cl closer to the ground. They have a higher metabolism. They're a lot more susceptible to poison than uh, gr grown-ups are. And we're susceptible enough, uh, as, as that story about the, the farmers in California tells us. So we, we can't, this is not something we can ignore or put off. Uh, it's something that, that needs to be done and needs to be done right away. And, and uh, Tiffany, uh, you must be able to give us stories of victories against pesticides in different parts of the world or at different parts of the country. Yes. So yes. there are <laughs> a number of hopeful stories. Um, I think one of the most recent victories is just yesterday. France oh. announced that it is willing to move forward with phasing out the use of glyphosate. So yay. Roundup. So that's, <laughs> yay, like a great, a great moment where we can say, okay, this is happening in other places around the world. It should be happening right here um, in, in New York, too, and all across the U.S. Um, the other great victory that happened just last week is the state of California, um, one of the courts there ruled that they are not going to be registering new uses of bee-killing neonicotinoid pesticides. Mm. So that's great. another great moment, piece of momentum we can really be harnessing and trying to use for places across the country. And I think the other hopeful thing is that there's been a number of states, local communities across the country that have all passed policies to either ban or restrict, whether it's one class of pesticides or multiple classes of pesticides, um, and really work towards implementing solutions, so integrated pest management or organic management of their land. There's been over 200 entities from businesses to uh, universities to cities to states that have all passed pollinator protection policies to restrict pollinator pesticides that are toxic to pollinators. So all of these are really important steps that are showing that there is a huge amount of momentum across the country to really work at reducing pesticide use. Well, 
That's really, really exciting news about France and some of these other initiatives. And Paula was yeah. taking notes frantically while yeah, you were talking, is. Tiffany. You're writing it all down, <laughs> Tiffany. But I'm, I would like to really urge people to involve children in this effort because, of course, they're the they're the people as. Ken said that are most impacted by pesticides, but they're also fierce advocates. <laughs> they are fierce little people of justice, um, and so I th- I think it's really important. Now we we uh, wanted to interview an organic farmer because we had read a book Molly's uh, Organic Farm. We and we want to interview an organic farmer. One of the kids' families belongs to a CSA way outside of New York and in Rhinebeck. So we w- instead of going to the farm because we're not really allowed to travel that far, mm. we interviewed the the organic farmer on Skype. So I <laughs> urge teachers get involved, get your students involved. It's in their self interest and they will the the families will be very 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 positive very helpful in this effort and it's fascinating when a kid realizes that food doesn't come from the store it comes from (laughs) a farm (laughs) and the store is sort of in the middle and and it's it's fascinating to watch them uh, realize and their eyes get bigger and bigger as they realize where their food comes from and uh, and about things growing and and stuff like that And and it makes and it makes the street trees look different to them. Yeah. Um, we we uh, had a, one interview, somebody who taught us a lot about this fight back. We uh, had a wonderful contact with Julia Chavez Rodriguez mm-hmm. uh, uh, two years ago. And she actually came. She was working at the White House at the time. She came to our classroom and a couple classes came into the room. And parents and grandparents, again, were in the room. And she we did a little play about her grandpa. And she talked to <laughs> us about how she and her family used to march with Cesar Chavez. And so there are a lot of people. They don't have to be, you know, Cesar Chavez's <laughs> granddaughter. But there are people involved in local fights and uh, around the country, and bring them into your classroom, or get the kids out to meet those people, because there are a lot of people who I think are our heroes, local heroes. We can work with so the kids can learn about this, and and families can learn about it, and get involved. Uh, d- Tiffany, do you travel? I do travel, yes. (laughs) Uh, We need you, (laughs) Tiffany. (laughs) Uh, It it, it really is uh, amazing uh, that there is so much going on under the radar. And uh, that is why I talk about the speed of getting these bills sponsored, because these huge corporations can be very slow in finding out what's going on. And, uh, you know, suddenly you've got, you know, 35 sponsors, and then the corporation finds out about it. Uh, and uh, I, I've seen that happen with a lot of bills in, in my environmental career. And, and then they sort of realize that, well, everybody's already against them, and, and their, their fight becomes very weak. And uh, they'll say things like, well, if you pass this ban, everybody will want one. <laughs> and, like, uh, and like any politician is going to care about that. Um, but... Um, that brings me to a topic. For those of you who are not in New York City, well, of course, your towns are spraying pesticides too. And they're using the same poisons they're using in New York City. Just because New York City has a great kindergarten teacher uh, like Paula here and uh, great students uh, doesn't mean that you don't also. And so uh, talk to your teachers and your students and see about getting bans in your municipalities because we should have the uh, parks and the schoolyards healthier for everybody. And that means the water will be healthier for everybody because this poison ends up in the water eventually, like everybody, everything else does. So no matter where you are, uh, there are people like this. And uh, uh, Paula, can they talk to you for advice? <laughs> sure. Uh, no, I'm but I, it's educators, sure. Parents, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, and Tiffany, I'm sure they can call Friends of Earth. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. We have several toolkits on our website at uh, foeforfriendsoftheearth.org slash beaction um, that are there for university students and high school students as well as cities and towns and uh, that walk everyone through all of the steps they need to take to pass a local policy in their community to ban these really toxic pesticides. And we're happy to walk folks through the toolkit 
to help them make their community a safe place for their them and their families and the environment. And uh, uh, can you give us a email address or a phone number or something they can call? Sure, they can call two zero two 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 zero seven one five, and they'll get connected with me. I'm happy to talk with them about how to pass a policy. Or you can email fo uh, it is b action at foe dot org. It's b e e action. B e e action yeah. yes at foe dot org. And that phone number again? It's two zero two. Two 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 zero seven one five. Zero seven one five. And uh, Friends of the Earth is an absolutely wonderful organization. Um, when when people have me list my top ten, they're always on it. And uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and Paula, is there a, a group or any way they can contact you? Uh, I'll give you my school email. It's P Rogovin R O G O V I N at p s two ninety dot org. Say that again. P. Rogovin, R-O-G-O-V-I-N, at ps290.org. ps290.org. Not dot .edu, dot .org. Dot .org. Huh. And uh, so... It's uh, a public school. Yeah. So uh, there's a, a lot of uh, ways of getting active, and there's a lot of things you can do, uh, both large and small. Uh, there are people who can speak to whatever your group you're with, whether it's a PTA or a church group or, or any uh, book club, anything. Um, uh, you want to get educated so that uh, you can feel the same passion that these kids feel uh, when they got educated about this. And it's, uh, it's, our, it's only our food at stake. And, and you know, we don't want poisons getting uh, dissolved into our water, and we don't want to be eating poison. But uh, the government is quite comfortable uh, with us doing that. And so it takes us to stop that from happening. And uh, uh, Tiffany mentioned a few victories, and there's a, quite a few others. There's bands in Europe. Uh, they've done the studies. So we don't even have to do the studies in this country. They've already been done for us in Europe. So it's just a matter of using those studies. So um, uh, any last words? We have about a minute left. Tiffany? Tiffany? Well, I would just say, yes, please get active. Please get involved. Contact um, your local policymakers to take action on this issue. It's really critical, and it's really in our own backyards and communities where we're going to be able to make a difference to protect our environment, uh, people, and the planet. And eventually that will build towards longer-term change that we can hopefully achieve at the federal level um, in order to, to really pr- have long-term protections for right. the environment. When the people lead, the leaders do follow. Yeah, and, exactly. And I'm hoping that people will reach out to the PTA at their school and get them involved and to organizations in their communities and have educational forums because people don't really know a lot about this issue. Often they don't know a lot about this issue. And there are a lot of resources, Tiffany, Friends of the Earth, and... And, um, uh, and Mount Sinai Hospital. Mount Sinai Hospital. And so there's so many other resources. So we, I urge you to really do that... Uh, uh, you know, educational work that's needed. Well, thank thank you, Paula Rogovin and Tiffany Fink Haynes for being on Ecologic today. And uh, coming up next is Out FM. So stay tuned. Every day is Earth Day. I'm Ken Gale, and this is Ecologic for September 26, 2017, here on WBAI New York, 99.5 FM and WBAI dot. Org. Let me start with congratulations. Feedspot selected the Environment TV as one of the top environmental blogs on the web. And Charlie Olson has been working really hard and, and deserves that honor. So congratulations to the Environment TV. And I hope to see you this Sunday, October 1st, at the Medieval Fair in Fort Tryon Park near the Cloisters. That's nearly at the northern tip of Manhattan overlooking the Hudson River. I'll be there all day with copies of Ecologic, Sunday, October 1st. And from one mood to another, the environmental movement lost two greats, Barry Liebman and Therese Chorin. Uh, Barry has been very active with New York City Friends of Clearwater over the last uh, couple of years. And 
I was also a writer for Mad Magazine, so I knew him from two different directions. And we would talk about environmental issues at comic book events and comic books at environmental events, uh, raising eyebrows to, to people overhearing us. And Therese Torin, oh, what a loss she is. Um, she had, I met her when she was still in college back in the early 80s. She died of cancer at age 55, uh, a long, long, painful bout of ca with cancer. And uh, she was one of those people, if she volunteered at a uh, meeting, it would get done. Whatever she volunteered to do, she would get done. Not everybody who volunteers for things that organizations actually does them. She was one that did. She was always out there doing things. I suspect many of you learned about Ecologic because she would bring Ecologic, fly Ecologic flyers to e environmental events that she would go to if, if she found out I wasn't going to be there. And she handed out hundreds and hundreds of Ecologic flyers. And if you donated to WBAI back when we were at 120 Wall Street, which was, boy, quite a few years ago now, uh, she was the main person who input the data from people pledging to WBAI and uh, got the information into our computer uh, quickly. But more importantly is that she was so smart and show, so attentive that if a m mistake was made, you know, some little mistake can have a big repercussion, she'd catch it, and she'd catch it right away before it got to be really bad. And because of her intelligence and attention to detail, she saved WBAI thousands of dollars, literally thousands of dollars. And some of you may have ended up getting the wrong premium, but she figured it out. And I would say, how did you know that? And she goes, I don't know, I just did. And, uh, and that was how she did things. Uh, getting ready to do today's show was difficult because I kept thinking of Therese and, and how much I missed her. And I would hear her voice in the back of my head say, don't you use me as an excuse to not get ready for your show. And uh, I tried not to. Um, but I, um, I have no trouble summoning up that uh, her twinkling smile, and that's how I'm going to remember her. But uh, Therese Chorin passed away at age 55. What an incredible loss. And... Back to news. Frequent guest Henry Gifford finally finished his book, Buildings Don't Lie, after 11 years. Henry is probably the top building infrastructure person in the United States. He's a harsh critic of lead standards and a plain talker. His book is, the most, is mostly illustrations of good and bad buildings or their innards with his explanations of why they're good or bad. It's technical in some ways, funny in other ways, and demystifying in most others. Some of you already know that you have to have this book. Others of you should definitely look through it at a brick-and-mortar bookstore before you decide. It's expensive. Buildings Don't Lie by Henry Gifford. I'm glad he finally finished that book. Scientists from the National Centers for Environmental Information tell us that the last three years have had the three hottest Augusts on record worldwide and the three and the last three June-August periods are the hottest on record worldwide. And it's the 41st consecutive August and the 300 and 392nd consecutive month with global temperatures above average. That's nearly 33 years in a row. Global temperatures have been above average. The global warming part of climate chaos is still very much with us. The Climate Prediction Center of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA.gov, shows equatorial sea surface temperature higher than normal, especially in the Western Pacific. It's not a full-blown El Nino, more of a La Nina, and thus more hurricanes are to come. An amendment to defund Hudson River fossil fuel anchorages passed the House of Representatives by a very big margin. I like what wonderful environmental activist J.K. Kanepa had to say about that, and I'm sure she echoes many of you. I had no idea that this area of the Hudson was all these things, especially that it is a super fun site and at the same time a critical habitat of an endangered species. There are two reasons. Th those are two of the reasons it was defunded. Also that there was a nuclear power plant on the Hudson River and a site on the National Register of Historic Places. That would be from the Revolutionary War. 
Of course, as the Senate also votes to defund, there is still the problem of the oil companies wanting to transport their commodities from north to south, so the bomb trains and explosive pipelines will continue. Rebecca Miles posted an article from Forbes magazine online on Facebook about ocean currents changing drastically due to global climate chaos. This, in turn, will change global climate further. As Lakota elder John Trudell said at an anti-nuclear rally back in 1979, we cannot destroy the earth, only our ability to live on it. I'm not saying that the species Homo sapiens, that's us, will go extinct due to what we're doing to our planetary home, but I do think there will be a population crash and crash of civilization that only the most pessimistic cyberpunk writers have written about. And don't believe the greenwashing coming out of Brazil. Rainforest Rescue reports that they want to deforest an area of rainforest the size of Denmark for mining and industrial agriculture. This Friday, those of you living in Manhattan will be able to watch a talk I gave at New York City Friends of Clearwater on the connection between hurricanes and global climate chaos. I quoted Tom Weissmuller's appearance on Ecologic uh, this past June, as well as information from NOAA, Naomi Klein, Mike Novacek, and other articles on weather, climate, El Ninos, and La Ninas. That's this Friday, September 29th at 10 a.m. on Channel 34 of Time Water and Channel 82 of RCN, and it's already on Joe Friendly's YouTube channel. There will be a march on the fifth anniversary of Superstorm Sandy to remember what was lost to Sandy and to resist the climate crisis and rise up together. Cadman Plaza in Brooklyn. Saturday, October 28th at 11 a.m. Cabinet Plaza is near the Brooklyn Bridge on the Brooklyn side. www.sandy5.org So that's Saturday, October 28th, 11 a.m. www.sandy5.org The Pope Climate Encyclical and the Butterfly DVDs are still available as a gift to you if you donate $40 via wwwgive 2 wb AI.org. Put ecologic or pope or religion or butterflies in the search box on the upper right. If you want to read the full articles I summarize on any episode of Ecologic from the past few years, including this one, I link to all those articles on the Ecolinks page of the Ecologic website, www.ecoradio.org. Our Facebook page is WBAI Ecologic, no spaces or dashes, WBAI Ecologic, and please click like. We're almost 800 likes. 800. For more environmental news, go to theenvironmenttv.com, biologicaldiversity.org, or ecowatch.com. You can find episodes of Ecologic on many different websites. The WBAI.org archives, theenvironmenttv.com, and my own permanent archives. They all have different shows for you to listen to or watch. There's a direct link to all those shows on the past guest page www.ecoradio.org is the main Ecologic page and will get you to the past guests page, the Ecolinks page, and my own permanent archives. Ecoradio.org. When your air or water is clean, thank an environmentalist. If not, become one. Enough said. WBAI's environmental show Ecologic is on every other Tuesday evening. Listen to scientists, activists, authors, and other experts discuss public policy and give you information on topics such as climate change, air, water, environmental justice, energy, both poisonous and renewable, healthy food, wildlife, transportation, green buildings, and of course, connections with other issues. You'll always find out what you can do to make the environment better, and every show starts with news and announcements on environmental actions. With your host, Ken Gale, every other Tuesday at 8 p.m. here on WBAI New York, 99.5 FM and WBAI.org.